Thank with you. Here. I appreciate it, Mike. Uh, it's good to be here with you all. Uh, we moved out here about two years ago, and I started teaching for CU Denver, and I teach political science. It's an AP course that we teach in high schools. And as I was teaching, I would say, Cold War, and the students would go, huh? Or vague. And I go, you know, Vietnam. And they go, well, that was 1955. And I go, no. And then I mentioned Korea, and they didn't know anything, and that pissed me off. So I started to put together a timeline and I did a PowerPoint, and I started to think about the people I knew who had died during that time, and there were seven people, including the guy I got my wings with. And then, um, through a matter of time, I connected with about 30 veterans on the internet, many of whom I didn't know, and I put together a book, and it's called Looking Back the Cold War, 30 Veterans and a Patrol Plane Commander Remember. And what I'd like to do today is two things, share, some background on the Cold War, and then specifically about flying patrol planes, anti-submarine warfare in the 70s and 80s. And I'd encourage you all to speak up anytime. I know a lot of you have experiences. And just a little bit of background, I'm from a farm in upstate New York. I milked cows, nobody was in the military in my family. I was a walk-on uh, at Cornell University, Navy ROTC, fall of 1968. 77 midshipmen started. And I was in a school that was extremely anti-war. There were anti-war demonstrations, people burning their draft cards. So by the spring, a lot of the uh, hotshot Navy regular scholarship students had dropped out and there were scholarships available and I needed one, so I got one. By the time we graduated in 72, we went from 77 down to 17. And in the Ivy League schools, there were only two left, Cornell and uh, Penn who kept it because they were all kicked off. So I had volunteered for a destroyer off Vietnam, uh, Richard B. Anderson, which was on the gun line right below the demilitarized zone. And we were also in 1972 involved in what was called linebacker ops. Uh, B-52s were going in. Of course, there was linebacker one and linebacker two, the one that was at Christmas. But there were also Navy ships going up there shelling Vin, which is the beginning of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and also up to the north. And then uh, after two years, I was sent to the Coral Sea. And a typical Navy thing, I didn't ask to go to the Coral Sea. The EXO says, you're going to the Coral Sea. And they were needing to beef people up because they needed to train people because they were getting ready to deploy again. So I went and I became um, qualified as an officer of deck fleet, which means there are about 10 of us uh, who could drive the ship for the captain. So I was up on the bridge. And we were involved when Vietnam fell. Um, that was called Frequent Wind in April 75. The planes that came out and the people, our ship was the guard aircraft carrier with airplanes on it for the other five uh, carriers that had clean decks. And then we did Mayaguez and went back home. And I applied to flight school. As a lot of people know, post Vietnam, the Navy was cleaning out, Army was cleaning out a lot of pilots. And I was fortunate enough because I'd been in contact with those aviators up on the bridge, they got me a slot in flight school in August of 75. And in December 76, less than 18 months later, I was now qualified to fly P3s. So let me go around the room, because I know all of you have Cold War background. Can you just say your name or service and maybe your MOS? Go ahead. Marv Eakes, uh, Korea, 1952 and three. Thank you. Dave Lewis, Vietnam, uh, vote master. Bill Markle, I was a doctor, not much of a, not much of a military man, <laughs> but I worked my bloody tail off. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Uh, Terry Rittenauer, uh, United States Marines, Vietnam, from 67 to 69. Thank you. Wow. John Ophelda, uh, 64 through 68. Actually, 69 June, uh, four different ships, so gun line. Another tin can sailor, yeah. gun line. Go ahead. Bill Bacon, uh, served eight years in the reserves and active duty uh, in Navy aviation. Great. I'm Charlie Park. I'm, I'm also a physician, and I uh, was Army, uh, I was active duty six and reserve 14. So wow. Two call ups in the reserves. Wow. Thank you. Uh, B. Johnson, 
Uh, I'm a flying officer in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and I was in the University Reserve Training Program. Two girls were chosen from each of the ten universities across Canada, and uh, I served in the early 60s. Which university were you from? I was from the University of Calgary, Alberta. Great, thank you. But I'm also American. I'm descended okay. from the <laughs> <laughs> I have dual citizenship. You got the best of both worlds. We want to live for both sides. That's great. <laughs> It helps i never served. That's all right, but we all serve and help the country. Thank you. Mike Kosar, a ROTC graduate of Michigan State, Army 1969 to 72, amazingly enough, Bottles, Germany. Really? <laughs> Clean living paid off. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Anybody else? Bob Bird, Air Force, 66 to 86. Thank you. Special agent, mostly intelligence, and uh, created and ran security for all stealth programs for the U.S. government. Thank you. No, uh, never and, wore a uniform. Yeah, and finally, I guess, uh, Mike Fellows. Oh, oh, you were yeah. here. Yeah. Walk Vietnam. Thank you. Yeah. And Mike Fellows, uh, Army, 1968 to 1994, mm -hmm. uh, from Vietnam, uh, Europe deployments, mm -hmm. um, other places. Uh, as a combat engineer. Thanks, Mike. And, and our academy graduate. Oh, you got one token academy man. <laughs> Army. That's West Point. <laughs> yes, sir. Jim Grow, U.S. Air Force, uh, served in England um, from 66 to 69. That's the way to do it, keep everything else going. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm honored to be with you, and I hope that we can get a discussion going. So I'm going to go through a bunch of stuff, background on the Cold War, and then get into the patrol stuff. Cold War officially went from 1947 to 1991. And 1947, because President Truman started the Truman Doctrine to contain communism, and also the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. And, as you were, and it ended in 91 when the Soviet Union broke apart. As you remember, after World War II ended, the Soviet armies had swept across Eastern Europe. They would left behind uh, secret police, army units, everything else. And over a period of three years, they took over all of Eastern Europe. Also, uh, there was a Greek civil war where the communists almost took power from 46 to 48. Uh, the communists were very close to taking power in Italy. In fact, the CIA in 1948 was heavily involved in the election to get the Christian Democrats elected in Italy. France, as we all know, has a strong communist background and socialist background. So things were really on the edge. And Cold War was a thing that encompassed millions of people on both sides of superpower conflict. Civilians. Civilians were mobilized for in all sorts of air industries. We were building one atom bomb a day in the 50s and 60s. There's an estimate that we had about, uh, between the Russians and us, 125,000 nuclear weapons. So there's a lot of chance for things to go wrong. Also, families took a lot of this because it involved military people. But the families, because these people were deployed all over the world, tens of thousands of people, to contain communism and our allies. And it's really important to show that the allies were with us from the very beginning. Uh, I've got a picture here of a stamp on NATO. NATO was formed in 1949, initially 12 countries, US, Canada, and European countries. This is the CENTO, Central Treaty Organization. That is Turkey, uh, Baghdad Pact, it's called, with Iraq, Iran, West Pakistan, us, CETO, Southeast Asian Treaty Organizations. These two were formed in 1955, and that is the Warsaw Pact, which originally had eight. So you can see that our whole effort was to try to contain uh, the Soviet Union, and eventually, after 49, when the Chinese went communist. Now, I want to flip back to 1918. America had 13,000 troops in Russia when the Bolsheviks took over in 1917. After the war ended, we sent people up to Archangel, 
that's an American sailor and probably a Marine guarding Bolshevik prisoners and Archangel. You can see the white forces are arranged around here. This is Vladivostok, a parade of allied forces, America, France, Britain, Japan. Those are Canadian troops in Siberia. These people came out mostly in 1919 and eventually by 1920. But in my view, we've never been close to the Soviet part of Russia since for 100 years. And basically, World War II was just a marriage of convenience. And I, I'm sure you know, Stalin and Hitler had a pact in 1939 to divide Europe. So when Hitler invaded Poland, Soviet Union came in from the east. So this whole thing sets the background for Cold War. Now, as most of us know, the military is a long period of routines, training, maybe a lot of boredom, remote sites being deployed away, punctuated by battles, sheer terror attacks, things like that. A lot of these, I put up, for example, the Dew Line. Uh, Canada and the United States created the Dew Line in 1954. 63 sites, they're mostly 200 to 300 miles above the Arctic Circle. Extremely remote, extremely important because that's Russia trying to get the early warning on the incoming forces. Uh, the NORAD, of course, is in Colorado Springs, but the Canadian always is the deputy of NORAD, and they're in Winnipeg. And this is a picture of an alert Royal Canadian Air Force. These are CF-100s, Canadian crews being alerted. Can is I it? Just yeah, you? sure, B. Yeah. Summer, I was stationed at Station Nemeo, which is just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. Okay. And Strategic Air Command had a colonel at, at our base, and the uh, every two weeks we had different crews fly in and go into the hole uh, on alert to monitor right. the dew line. Yep. And what years was that about? That was in the like 61 to 64. Though. Right. And I met a Canadian in a bar in Florida, which is surprising, but uh, he had been on a dew line for three years. And I, I, my hat's off to these people. Uh, in the Air Force, I know there were a lot of time it was punishment to be sent to Thule or some of these uh, high places. And does anybody know what this is? It's called a Texas Tower, and they had three of them. One was off of Long Island, but it blew down the hurricane, Nantucket, and there was one up here. And again, this was to try to get more early warning alert. And there were real gaps. So you had to fill the gaps with airplanes and ships, and that's a DER, an escort radar ship. So can you imagine North Atlantic banging around? Your main job is to keep that radar going. And then the counterpart is this Willie Victor, six, uh, about 16 people on this. It is an airborne radar called barrier. These were called barrier patrol. And I met a guy a couple of weeks ago who was a navigator in this. And I said, well, how long were we up for? He said about 16 hours. And he was in the Pacific over on this side. And they were based in Hawaii. This is, this just amazes me. This is a air defense radar. There were 28 sets bought from IBM for 1.2 billion, 60,000 vacuum tubes each. And these were to correlate all this input from these various radars. So each one of these took three megawatts. Each station had its own power station, three megawatts. It's freaking unbelievable. Now the sheer terror. Um, through the email, I got in touch with some people who were reserve P2 people. And P2s are right here, and Bill was on them. So if you've got any questions... 155 miles an hour cruise, crew of 10 roughly, rides, as my friend who was a flight engineer said, it, r it rode like a ranch pickup truck. You know, it just banged along. And then when the P3s came, they were like Cadillacs compared to that. But these were very strong workhorses. So Roger Stambaugh was in the uh, Navy for three years. He was a walk-on who, in 1959, got to go through flight school he had his own crew, 25 years old. They flew from Alameda to Norfolk, Virginia to get training. They go down their final day to fly back to Alameda, and there's a guard on the plane. 
and they've loaded a nuclear depth bomb, which nobody's told him about. So he runs across to the headquarters and this admiral says, Cuban Missile Crisis, you now belong to me. Go down there. These ships are coming in. We're try they've got three or four submarines underneath. We need to track them. If you find one, let us know and we'll let you know whether to use a nuclear depth bomb. And if you can't find him, use your own judgment. <laughs> and he goes, think about it. I'm a 25-year-old PPC. He doesn't know anything about Norfolk or the Atlantic because he's a Pacific guy and he's carrying a nuke. So that's the way it was. Now, at the same time, this man, Vasily Arkhipov, was the flotilla commander for those four submarines. And they've been pinged and people have been dropping sus, sound underwater, underwater signal, which is really a grenade. So they, they thought World War III had started and they couldn't get to Moscow. So the captain and the communist political officer, the protocol was they got together and they agreed to use the nuclear torpedo and blow away the biggest ship they could find. But this guy happened to be on as a flotilla commander and he said, no, uh, I'll overrule you, surface, let's listen to uh, Moscow. And they found out they got the order to back off. So he is a huge hero because he Help stop. He was in one of these old diesel boats. Does anybody know what this thing is? That's USS Agrawal. That is exactly what it is. And it's also the first time we fired a nuclear ash rock. And an anti-submarine rocket, it can go, that looks like it's a mile or two away, but it can go up to 10 miles, 10 kilotons, when you absolutely positively have to blow away a submarine. Now, one of the things that as I was going down all these rabbit holes, I had this feeling that a lot of people had been killed and wounded. And why, you know, I was on very safe type of plane and we, we went down by Libya, but we were 25 miles off and we're down to 200 feet. And it was, but these guys before satellites and satellites came in 1959, they were hem stitching the worst places, red China, Korea, Russia and fighters were coming out and shooting down people. Look at this, 1950, 51, all these people are being killed. Swatow Island, anti-aircraft fire. So they got really in close. This one got ditched, one was killed. These are survivors. Take a notice of this. This Chinese fighter in 1956 shot this one down 32 miles off the coast, 16 dead. This one is North Korea 69. This is the largest single aircraft loss, 90 miles away from Korea, and they shoot down one of our VQ surveillance planes, 31 killed. This is Ron Wheeler who wrote, I found this on the internet, and I actually went to meet him. Uh, he lives now in Albany, New York. He was a radar operator in a P-2, and he talked about his squadron sending out a SAR, a search and rescue, up to North Italy because another P-2 had crashed up there, and then the SAR bird crashed. So now that's 20 people dead. And then at the same time over in the Pacific, a week later, another P-2 crashes. So 30 people die within the space of one or two weeks. And each one of those has a family, a community, et cetera. And as you saw in a previous slide, there were 1,149 casualties. And by the way, that casualty list was kept by VP International, which is the Canadians uh, up at Greenwood, uh, Nova Scotia. They have uh, a listing, a uh, roll of honor of all the patrol people from each country. So that's where I dug that out. And look at what uh, Ron says here. He says, we serve time when Russia, China, North Korea at war with us, sometimes deadly, shot down, but more often with antagonistic in your face exercises, close encounters with their aircraft. And I am convinced that a lot of this, of course, was secret at the time. And to this day, a lot of people don't know how close a lot of these people were. Now, here's the Air Force. Out of Thule, Greenland, RB-47, hem-stitching again. And at one time, I think there was one that came out of England that went up here and went 400 miles into Russia. And what they were doing was, besides photographing, they were trying to get air samples of atomic tests so we could tell how far the nukes uh, were going in Soviet Union. This is an 18-year-old uh, next to a Banshee, which is a straight-winged early jet fighter converted for photograph reconnaissance. 
His brother was a radar officer in this A1 SPAD that's converted with a big radar. So from a pilot standpoint, this thing, you know, it's got too much stuff hung on it, big gas tanks, three people crammed in where one was supposed to be, and they lost one in his brother's squadron, and brother never wanted to fly again. So, you know, they're flying in bad weather, they're flying in a propeller plane, single engine, people were taking a lot of risks. Um, this is a great book. This William E. Burroughs, America's Secret Air War in the Cold War, dug up a lot of stuff that the Defense Department and State Department were trying to keep secret. The Russians didn't want to admit stuff, but a lot happened. We had people that were taken prisoner and not let go, etc. Here's the uh, hundreds dead on Air Force missions. 16 aircraft shot down, 163 killed just uh, overall, and there were many more than that. Look at this. People, uh, an old B-29 in 1953 shot down. People kept until 1956. These guys were shot down. Four of the six air crewmen perished and two were held for many months. And that's supposed to be a plane with three people in it originally, and they've got six in it. So they've got all these planes, and this is what did it. Now, uh, the triad. Sure. Um, my kid brother was in the uh, Air Force yeah. uh, stationed at Burlington, Vermont, from uh, 56 to, through 58. Yep. I said, he said their captain was spending most of the time down at AT&T uh, uh, R&D. What were you doing? He didn't tell me. He said, yeah. I can't tell you. 25 years later, he said we were processing 1,500 feet of film a week. My gosh. At, at Burlington, Vermont. Yep. Where were they getting the film? I can't tell you. Well, where they were getting the film, because I'm from upstate New York. So you've got Griffiths Air Force Base over by Utica, which was B-52s and fighters. And then up in Plattsburgh, you had another operation. And then there's Loring, Maine, which is B-52s and tankers. And they probably had some sort of recon thing going, and that was the central thing. So that there were so many people involved in intelligence. My Second cousin was an Air Force guy in a tunnel in Berlin, and he was basically underground listening. He was a Russian linguist. So I can't tell you. He kept saying, "Yep." Well, I I taught at Plattsburgh State from '62 to '68. Yeah. Uh, my wife was teaching at a, an elementary school, uh, subbing. Yeah. And suddenly there was so much noise out at the air base. She came home. That I don't know what's happened. Yep. Well, they were lo they were loading. During the uh, the crisis, the, the Mediterranean or Cuban crisis, yep. they were loading those bombers, going to Albuquerque, loading up with. Yep, and it was all everybody was leaving. Oh yeah, and we were. And you know that, re that reminds me. Uh, I went out to get the cows around 1964 at four o'clock in the afternoon, and this jet with a delta wing came right over the treetops and got over the barn which had a big aluminum roof 120 feet long and just went straight up and it scared the shit out of me and the cows <laughs> and what it was was this hot shot i'm pretty sure was doing a nuclear bomb drop because he could see this aluminum our steel roof and he went straight up and then another time when I was at Cornell, when the anti-war stuff was going, two things happened. Cornell's full of anti-war stuff, and one Sunday morning, helicopters came up from the lake and went right over the dorms at about 50 feet and went up the hill to basically say, screw you. And another time, a reserve Air Force, I think it was F-106, came in and just went straight up, you know, just bombed the place to <laughs> show those hippies what was going on. That's the way it was. Well, back to the Navy, uh, a reminder, and I didn't realize this, but until uh, the late 50s, there were no ICBMs. There were only bombers, and the bombers were supreme, 
And then ICBMs came late 50s and the Russians got them also. And then uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles only came, this is 1959, the USS George Washington. And then the Russians had a very uh, dangerous one submarine in the early 60s. And then they finally got what's called the Yankee class, which is like this, which we'll talk about later. The reason is, first of all, the most accurate is an ICBM. And as Jim Newell spoke uh, last month about it, they're fixed. They know exactly where they're taking off. They have the best um, inertial navigation. In this case, you may have the best missile navigation in your Polaris, but where is the submarine when it takes off? And at that time, there were these huge inertial systems called ship's inertial navigation system. When I was on the Coral Sea, go down the bottom of the ship and there'd be a room and this huge gyro with about three guys monitoring it because that way the ship would know exactly where it was when the jets took off or et cetera. So this whole navigation piece is important. This is the prototype for a nuclear submarine and what they're doing is sloshing it around with a nuclear reactor on it to make sure it can survive. Whoops. Now the Navy, so the Air Force is primary with bombers as we all know, uh, B-47s, uh, B-52s, but the Navy was desperately trying to be in the nuclear delivery business. And this is an A-3 which was built specifically by Douglas for the Navy to have a nuclear bomb load. These are vigilantes, they are A-5s, uh, very sleek, very fast, but look at all the deck space it took up on the carrier. What do you think this is? That's, that's Bill's airplane taking off from an aircraft carrier with jet assist. With JATOs. JATOs, and Bill, the wing clearance, just like with Jimmy, uh, Doolittle there was about three or five feet. And JATOs, and the whole idea was you would have a heavy lift airplane that you could get out farther and get the atom bomb somewhere, and then this guy had to get somewhere to land or ditch. Now this is John's Agerholm. There's a nuclear depth bomb. That's an up close. Now John and I know that this ASROC was always guarded by a Navy petty officer with a web belt and a 45. Even when and they loaded it, they even, you couldn't even watch him. Right. And so we're at sea, and there's a guy up there on the ASROC deck making sure the commies don't come and, you know, unbolt our ASROC. <laughs> and sailors are, I will just say, weapons and sailors. So they go down the mess decks to clear the weapon and turn it over to the next guy who had to go up. It clears the weapon, pulls the trigger, and there's a round in there. So here's the overhead. It goes bong, 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 bong. <laughs> now this is a problem because these guys are working on a nuclear weapon. So that's probably a broken arrow report. And the rest is history. <laughs> now, uh, these are the kind of things you may have. This is a submarine. It's called Grayback. And they had this Regulus missile, which is a surface-to-surface nuclear-tipped missile. The Russians had the same type of missiles systems out of a submarine. This is an Echo class, Echo 2. And this is the first nuclear with three rockets here. Nuclear submarine, these things were extremely uh, kludgy and there were a lot of uh, nuclear accidents. So that's their way of trying to get in the submarine business, which they caught up very quickly and that's what my squadron was involved in. Now, here's some Navy nuclear accidents. There is still a nuclear depth bomb lost in the mud of Puget Sound thanks to a Navy P5M crash. These are, we know about the Thresher, K-19 reactor cooling, Golf 2. This is the one I think that the Howard Hughes Glomar Explorer brought up. Scorpion, 99 lost. So there were to get to this point of nuclear deterrence. And if you think about it, the most important thing was a missile launching submarine. And then they were guarded by attack submarines. Our attack submarines are trying to get their missile submarines. Their attack submarines trying to get our attack submarines. So you sometimes had uh, maybe three submarines in trail. There was a lot going on. Did they ever have a cause for the Scorpion going down? 
Uh, I have tried to find that out, and I don't think they know. It was coming back, and um, this affected my family because my cousin, Freddie, was a reactor man. He was a first class on uh, the skipjack, and his friend and he uh, graduated from sub-school together, and his friend went to Scorpion, and he went to Skipjack. And we, you know, we didn't know the names very well, and we thought he, he had gone down, but I'm not sure exactly why it went down. A lot of these are, see, this is a Yankee missile tube explosion. That's in 86. These things came out in 1968, so now it's a little long in a tooth. That means a missile cooked off, one of the probably 12 missiles. I really like uh, these charts. This is around 1960, you can see, or 50s. It's your choice, where do you draw the line against communism? The whole thing was domino theory, spread of communism. The British had been successful right here in the Malay Peninsula. They'd sent in uh, counter guerrilla people and nipped a communist insurgency here. But the whole thing that was happening in North Vietnam was completely different. This shows where our bomber laydown was starting in 1945 and how it got bigger and bigger. It's 56. And we're surrounding, there's Guam in 51, we're surrounding Soviet Union. 1955, Germany, Tunisia. Look at all the people, look at all the money. Um, we had 12 B-52s airborne in the 60s. It was called Chrome Dome. Each had four nuclear weapons on it. Often they were up for over 12 hours. Unfortunate that Lou Moyer couldn't be. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. He was heavily involved in, 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 you know, as a B-52 commander. He was, and I, he did a lot of planning and all these things. Um, he was, this was his time. There's Greenland, by the way, 1958. UK, 1954. Germany. Now, as you get into Vietnam, um, as we remember, March 8th, 1965, Marines land in Da Nang. They were to secure the air base at Da Nang. They were told, don't be aggressive, don't go after Viet Cong, just secure the base. And that, of course, changed very rapidly. Um, these guys are in a Hmong special guerrilla unit trained by CIA. He's from Westminster. He's from Minnesota. He was uh, captured by the North Vietnamese in Laos and held POW for 19 years. These guys lost 30,000 dead out of uh, 240,000 military age men and women. <clears throat> they held our northern part of Laos. Um, our Congressman Perlmutter had this thing for veteran Vietnam era people, and he thought he'd do one. Did anybody go to those? It was uh, last February, March, and so many veterans signed up, he had to do eight of them. And these guys showed up, and that's where I met them. Now, this is my friend Ralph Timmons. He had been one of these Marines in an Amtrak uh, platoon in 1965, he went back to college. He didn't like what he saw, and he joined the Army. And he said a lot of this was to emulate the World War II vets and Kennedy's call, don't ask what you can do, your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. He, this is Ralph. He was the oldest guy in his LERP team, 24. These are the guys that went out uh, behind enemy lines. They were dropped in by helicopters. This is a McGuire rig. They're training LERPs how to uh, hook up and be towed out by uh, helicopters if they cannot, if a helicopter can't land. Does anybody know about these combined action program, the Marines? This was the early attempt to put medics and people into villages to build trust. And they were very vulnerable because maybe it's a six or eight man team and my friend I bailed hay with, Bob Champier, was in this, and uh, his unit was overrun. They were ro rocket attacked. They were all, most of them were killed. He, he died in 69 around Tet, and, uh, or 68. Let's see. Has anybody seen this picture of the Jefferson County platoon? 
Yeah. They just had their reunion. Yeah. And they're still trying to find people in this. And they'd all enlisted and trained together. And uh, that was 68. And by, as you all know, uh, the biggest amount of troops was in late 1968, almost 550,000 troops. And a lot of Americans don't realize this. That affected so many people, so many communities. This is my neighbor, uh, Bob, who he and his friend on a lark decided to join the Army. They were in college in New Mexico, and they decided to join the Army and be helicopter pilots. And I said, Bob, that looks like a silver star on your coat. Oh, I did something stupid. Well, what he did was he was involved in going into the area around Quezon when it was heavily um, fortified by the North Vietnamese, and he uh, pulled people out. This is a B-66, which remember that uh, Navy A-3, this is the Air Force version leading F-105s into North Vietnam. The city yeah. of Lakewood uh, did a very nice ceremony for the Jefferson County platoon. Did they? I think Good. there was like 25 of them they were able to find. Yeah. But they even have a bench dedicated right. to them at the city now. So. No, that's great. That's great. Uh, this, for John and I, what's that look like? This is uh, my ship, Fram 1. Uh, Mount 51 and 52, notice those barrels are all burned. We had a captain named Crazy Joe who was trying to set a record in firing uh, five-inch shells, and he did. They shot 33,000 five-inch shells in eight months, and part of that was because the North Vietnamese came down in spring of 72 into I Corps, and uh, my ship was involved in that before, just before I got there. And then we were involved, uh, as I said, going up to North Vietnam. So he would shoot at anything. And he was, in, he, was, he was a nut. So we went into Da Nang because I remember I was on the bridge with my binoculars, you know, World War II binoculars, junior officer of the deck, and there's boom, 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 and all of a sudden you hear click, and that means the firing pin is hit and you have a misfire. And then they put a hose down the barrel to cool it, and there's six guys in each of those mounts. So if it blows, they're all dead. Well, yeah. Yes. I can. And this ship went into Da Nang and in a morning. They basically redid all four gun barrels, and we went back out that night and went up to North Vietnam and started shooting again. So that's the kind of stuff that was going on. Uh, this is a... Underway replenishment, an oiler, and this is the Coral Sea. This is, you're going 12 knots when this happens. This is about 100, 120 feet. That's your point guard destroyer. So that was the ship I was helping to drive. And then I went directly from coming off that deployment to flight school. This is the Dilbert Dunker. Does anybody know what that is? Did you go through that thing, Bill? Never did. All right. <laughs> well, now this is from World War II, and you're supposed to be a little fighter jet pilot that's crashing and they let that thing go and it's got holes in the bottom and cleverly it'll tip over and then you're supposed to wait till water goes up your nose and take off your you're hooked in with your radio cord and you're supposed to pull that get your straps off dive down and get under and they're always teaching you how to get away from burning oil and stuff so that's the flight school and at that time we were flying T-34, then T-28. This is a B-17 engine, an R-1820. And then this is two B-17 engines with, this is an S-2. And what they had done, it was a longer plane. It was like a B-25, but it took up too much room on aircraft carriers. So they took a piece out, which made it longitudinally unstable. So they put, this is from the Grumman Ironworks down in Long Island. They put about a two-foot, uh, yaw damper, they called it, on horizontal stabilizer, and it was full of lead weight, and that worked out pretty good. They didn't need to do any of that computer stuff, just some <laughs> lead weight. <laughs> so this is a history, short history, of patrol aviation. We all remember the PBY Catalina, and that's one off of Greenland. There's a ice. 
This is off of Vietnam. This is market time. This is a P-5 flying boat. And market time was a huge Navy effort with ships, including Navy and Coast Guard, to interdict the supply lanes because the North Vietnamese were always bringing stuff down around the coast to insert to the Viet Cong and also to Sihanoukville, which is over in Cambodia. So these guys were all over the place. And P-2s were involved. There's a P-2 rigging uh, helicopter ship in the 60s. This is Moskva, the new, at that time, Russian helicopter carrier. This is a P-3. See all that smoke coming out? That's, um, this is the Allison T-56-14A engine, 4,600 shaft horsepower. We could fly on two of these, not low, but up higher. And this is where we're at now. This is a Boeing 737 converted to become the P-8. Now it has nine crew members, including women, and this had 12, that had 10. I think that had about 10. So that's where we are today, and they're full of computers, uh, but I'm not sure they can find submarines anymore. That was kind of a black art, and uh, they have a lot of cool tech stuff. Now, uh, squadrons. We had, at that time in the late 70s, 24 active, six reserve squadrons, each with about 450 people, nine aircraft, and we had uh, 12 crews made up of 12 each. So that's a lot of people. And to give you a, an idea now, there are 12 squadrons made up of six aircraft with nine people on each airplane. So instead of 450, they probably got 250 in a squadron. Allies were extremely important. The Canadians were flying this big Argus, which was like a World War II bomber. They also <clears throat> eventually got uh, the Aurora, which is a P-3. This is a Dutch P-3 in Iceland. Allies were integrated into, you could only go out on a, say an eight hour patrol, it'd take two hours to get up over the Arctic Circle, four hours on station, two hours back. So somebody's gotta be constantly coming up. So we integrated Canadians, British in Nimrods, and uh, Dutch. And you could eat off the floor of this plane. The Dutch, this was clean as a whistle. These are flight engineers. They're a dying breed because there's, in the new plane, the P3 doesn't have flight engineers, but these guys are weight, worth their weight in gold because there was another set of eyes in the cockpit they're watching the engine instruments, and we're down at 200 feet during the day a lot and 300 feet at night. And this is my old squadron, 45 Pelicans. It's a World War II squadron, and in that drop down from 24 to 12, this is one of the few that's left. And here is the state-of-the-art 1970 version P3 Charlie, which was a huge advance over the P3A and B because it had this, CP901. And that's one equipment bay, goes back three feet, then there's another one, another one, and another one. And even in Florida, we're wearing coats, flight jackets, because we had to keep this thing cold. It was always dying. There were big tapes, we were recording stuff. And just to show, there's that air defense computer that the Air Force used 60,000 vacuum tubes, that's circa 1958, to a digital computer in around 1968. So in 10 years, we went to this. The um, typical mission, this is Iceland, by the way. Iceland was a high mission. You would go up maybe 14 or 16,000, save fuel, probably shut down number one engine when you got to altitude. You could shut down number four also, but you'd have to be at a lower altitude. We dropped buoys, we had 84 buoys, 36 internal, 48 here. A lot of times the buoys would ice up when they went down and that screwed us up because they have a hydrophone and it takes a while for that to spool out, set at different depths. There's all sorts of things about salinity, temperature, depth, as far as how sound travels. So there was a time lag from the time you dropped a buoy. Eight to 10 hour missions, we also had magnetic anomaly detector. So you, that's why you got down to 200 feet for your attack. 
to see if there w the needle would swing. So if you went over a sunken ship, it would swing, but if it went over a submarine, it should swing too. And that was how we attacked. And we were always practicing attacks in case uh, the war came. FLIR, we had that infrared radar, didn't use it much. Uh, radar didn't use that much because we had it turned off all the time. And we had uh, an in-flight technician. This is my old buddy, Jim Cole. This is the tactical coordinator who was a new position because with the computer, you could now coordinate a lot more information. So the buoys were dropped, parachute. They'd get down there and say in Iceland, maybe 20 or 30% wouldn't work and he'd have to drop more. And you're putting a pattern in and, or a barrier and then uh, hopefully the submarine would run through it and then you could localize a little more and then be tracking for four hours and then another plane would come in silently below you or actually come in above you and we'd go out underneath and we'd drop a, usually a channel 15 buoy and that would be the turnover buoy and it was all done silently. The problem with this is everything's turned off, no radar, no radios, you're in the worst weather in the world and you're doing it because you need to absolutely know where these submarines are. So you could run into turbulence, bad things happen, planes didn't return, uh, there's a lot that can happen. We also used forecast bar barometric altimeter. What they thought it would be like in eight hours could be completely different if you're 500 miles away and a front comes through. This is the stations for sensor one and two, acoustic, paper, grams. So what's happening is the signal passively is being picked up here. It's shown here and every noise available, brine, shrimp, a trawler, and you were able to, with your operators who are experienced, try to determine what that particular sound signature was. And I will tell you a story. So in the, around 77, we were back in Jacksonville, and I don't know if you remember, HP 67 computer, it was about this big and it cost 2,000 bucks, and it was a very high-tech computer, and the Navy got them, and they had little uh, metal slides that went in. Each of those slides had a particular Soviet submarine signature, which was above top secret. And one day, and each TACO had one. And one day a guy goes to his locker and it's not there. So the shit hit the fan. And we looked and looked and looked because now it, they didn't care about the $2,000 computer. They cared about those little things. And I can remember tearing, we all, even pilots, everybody was tearing a squadron apart and they never found them. But somebody had stolen that computer out of a locked, the guy had lost it. So this is a track ball, which is what a mouse is now. Here's the screen where he gets everything together, a tactical coordinator, senior navigator. There's another navigator across from him, navigator communicator. So here's a typical guy, algebra teacher, his father was a chief petty officer, so he joins the Navy and he rises to the top of our squadron. He is the guy who checks out the other uh, tacos and he's Mr. Quiet, really smart guy, really knows how to work with people, gets out of the Navy, Duke Law School. He's a, a big attorney in Norfolk now, Warren Tisdale. But I bring this up because there were a lot of volunteers at this time. Um, this is the GIUK gap, Greenland, Iceland, or Iceland, UK. The Norwegians would pick up the Soviet submarines as they came around the corner here. This is the Kola Peninsula. And hopefully they'd give us a hot contact. So we had to fly way up here. And then we'd track, track, track for four hours. And usually they were chugging along because they wanted to get on station if they were we wanted to know, are you going through the Greenland-Iceland gap, which means you're going into the deep Atlantic. And they'd, we had bases in Bermuda, Azores, and Spain. And they would go as far as they could away from all those. And you could track them when they were moving fast, but when they got on station, they were just basically loitering, maybe two to three knots, not making very much noise at all. And they were very dangerous because they either had 16 or 12 
missiles launched. So uh, our whole idea was to track. And then at the same time in Iceland, we had a fighter squadron, Air Force, for intercepts, and there was an AWACS squadron. In fact, this says AWACS. And when I was there, it was an old uh, Constellation EC-121, I think. So that's a laydown of what it looked like. This is our very professional adversary, the Soviet submarine fleet. This says Severny Flot. That means Northern Fleet. That's a 25-year pin. These guys in the Northern Fleet were the best in the world. So we were on them. And it's interesting, our counterparts who were in the Pacific often didn't see a submarine their whole time, three years. They did a lot of surveillance, maybe some diesels, but the stuff getting into the Atlantic because that was closest to America. Uh, this is a Yankee boat, and uh, each of these has a separate target in America. So the idea was to track it, know where it is, and be able to kill it with a nuclear-tipped torpedo. Now, there is a relationship that I did not know about. My friend who flew B-52 said that in their PSYOP, which is single integrated operational plan for nuclear armed B-52s, if we were in contact with the Soviet ballistic missile submarine with the missiles, or we lost it, this would change how much they would be on alert as far as the time frame. These are, uh, this is what it looks like if you're down at 200 feet, 30, 40 degree angle of bank, often the autopilot would click off and you just, just kept flying based on the horizon. There's our flight manual, that's MA. That is the prop diagram. And in the Navy, everybody, flight engineers especially, but pilots, we had to memorize this and be able to talk about it to make co-pilot. This is another world. This is Sicily. I was stationed here three times, three six-month deployments, Sigonella. Uh, we were tracking mostly diesel submarines. This is the Juliet, which has four uh, cruise missiles on it, and they were uh, nuclear-armed to kill carriers, aircraft carriers. That's a close-up uh, Navy shot of uh, a Juliet sail. That's a radar. Uh, there's EW pipes etc. And that's, uh, if we were lucky enough, uh, and we got good enough, we could uh, get these guys. We would track these at night, trying to, they would have to come up to snorkel because they're diesel. So we would be doing these long patrols, trying to catch them snorkeling with visual, looking up moon and radar over our shoulder, a la World War II. And this is where the uh, Soviets hung out, the Gulf of Hammamet. They had a wagon train of ships. This is the 80s, the other squadron I was in, Woodpeckers. Um, as you recall, there was a strategic defense initiative. Our Navy secretary sent battle groups very close up into the Kola Peninsula area and up to Vladivostok, Sea of O, we call it, Sea of Okhotsk. It was a very dangerous time. Uh, ocean safari exercises were these huge NATO exercises, hundreds of ships, hundreds of ships into the Norwegian Sea right next to the... Soviets. And this is uh, my note. From the time I was in P3s, we lost throughout the P3 squadron fleet. Seven were lost, uh, 70 killed. And um, this is harpoons, anti-ship missiles. We were doing over-the-horizon targeting with F-18s in the mid-80s. This is a McDonnell Douglas tech rep who rode with our crew. How's it feel? because we were at 300 feet, 300 knots, you know, really banging along. And I go, well, the, the yoke is vibrating. And he, McDonnell Douglas guy goes, no, it isn't. And I go, put your hand on here. And it's going brrrr, because that meant, you know, metal fatigue on the wing. And they eventually did put the harpoons in a little closer. But this was to give more range. And my bottom line is this was a very dangerous time in the mid-50s. I did um, put together a bunch of books. If anybody hasn't read uh, Chicken Hawk by Robert Mason, this is a really important book, Battle for Hui. This one, 
Burroughs, Hell in a Very Small Place by Bernard Fall. And this, I love this movie because it shows a lot of the old, newest planes with Jimmy Stewart in it. And then this is my book down at uh, Tattered Cover, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, John. The full class for the yeah. show is big, huge on track. Well, they didn't have them when I was in there, but the answer is anytime a submarine is that big, it displaces a lot of water, so that's one thing. But something happened around 1984. Toshiba in Japan and Kongsberg in Norway had these nine axis milling machines that were not supposed to be sold to the communist bloc, and they sold three or four of them to the Russians, made a lot of money, and within, say, months, they remachined their uh, complex curves on their submarine propellers, and that's how we kept track of each one was different because it was hand-done, signature, and suddenly they went silent. So now instead of tracking, I don't know, in good water, maybe 300, 500 yards, you might have to be at 100 yards. I mean, you had to be right on top of them. And then we had Johnny Walker, the Navy spy, and his son gave away my whole, everything I did, this, all this above top secret stuff was given away. So the Russians had an idea how good we were or how bad we were. Yes? Does it make sense, in light of this, in 1958, just before my brother got out of the yep. service, uh, he traveled to Pacific, he and some of his colleagues, and and Australia said, what were you doing? He said, we were looking for sites similar to ours. Correct. What were you doing? I can't tell you what we're doing. We're looking for more sites. This is the guy in Burlington. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the whole idea was they were having a network, and they were making sure that the allies, and there's a thing called Four Eyes, which is British, Australian, Canadians, New Zealand's, and U.S., the old British Empire people, Five Eyes, got to have the highest ratings. And there's something else. We were briefed in 1976 when I was going through training before I got to the squadron on SOSIS, Sound Underwater System. There are these cables that were put out in various parts of the world that listened to all the noises and the computers collated them. So we might know there was a submarine in this huge area, but at least we could start with that huge area. They were in Broadie, Wales, so the British had them. I'm sure they were up in Canada. They were these long, and we even had them uh, put secretly over by the Sea of Okhotsk so we could tell when the Soviet submarines came out of the east. And we were locked in a room, no windows, had to sign a thing, never talk about this. The next year it's on the front page of the freaking New York Times. So there you go. So this cost a lot of money. It was extremely vital, along with what the Air Force was doing, what your brother was doing. I mean, the, especially the intel stuff and compiling this stuff so we could have the actionable intelligence. I think what's amazing is you think of the technology that yeah. you've been talking about. It's probably progressed a whole nother level. It has. In you know, the 10, 15 years since the late 90s. It has. And you know, the hunting and chasing each other is still going on. Uh, both in the Pacific and, you know, the Atlantic, certainly. And also, to your point, Mike, the Chinese and the Russians are working on a new attack submarine. Eventually, by 2020, the Chinese will have 80 attack submarines in the Pacific, which will be more attack submarines than we do. Now, they may not be as good, but they are coming up very fast. Well, Don, thank you. Thank you so much for being our speaker. All right. And there's one of oh, our Oh, thank you very points, much. So thank you. Appreciate it. And thank we'll you very much. hope to get you back All right. next year. Here. And I appreciate it.